Muslims who came to the Americas as slaves and how many different stories. And some of these stories now are being turned into documentaries and to films. So it's a history that African Americans are coming to terms with because even some of the black church in America doesn't realize how much of even black religion, as it's sometimes called, is rooted in a much more uh, hybrid set of practices, a broader set of practices, many of which were borrowed from Islam. What Sylvia and the youth does, which is really from phenomenal, is she'll take West African calls to prayer and juxtapose it with old Negro spirituals, right, that the slaves used to sing, and show that not only the same intonations, but sometimes even the same words disguised in a very kind of different context came out. So there was even dhikr. And it's, uh, yesterday we visit the Ahlillahi uh, community, and right before Salat, we heard the very traditional dhikr, and after Salat, and that type of dhikr has a very similar sound to the intonations of West, kind of what, what comes out of the Mississippi Delta Negro spiritual blues even, right? So this is a part of American history. Uh, it informed cultural uh, dynamics, it informed spiritual dynamics, but what was the real impetus, of course, for American Islam comes not during the 1800s, but into the, into the early 20th century, in the 1900s, when after the emancipation of slaves and what's called in America the Great Migration, many uh, African Americans move from a, the, the South into urban areas like Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, and of course this happens at a time in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when there's industry, there's job right around World War I, most of the African Americans move into industry, they move into major urban centers, and part of exploring a new sense of identity, remember many of them are just a generation removed from slavery, where they were, you know, subjected to extraordinarily inhuman conditions, told not to ever even look at a white man in the eye, right? That was a, that was a law um, in some of the books, that that was illegal, right? Uh, and there were, there were these types of conditions. So coming from that sense of degradation to urban centers, looking for new spiritual identities, looking for a new way of asserting one's humanity, and in doing that, exploring a reconnection to a, a past that was taken from them. And in that sense, Islam, although not well understood, was known to be part of that past part of that connection to Africa. And so different groups start resuscitating a kind of connection to a Muslim identity, right? And part of that, those groups are groups like the Nation of Islam, all right? The group that, that was the product of Malcolm X. I mean, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali come out of this movement. And although the nation, you know, of course, it gets very controversial. Really, what the Nation of Islam did in early parts of the century, many of its teachings did not come from Islam, right? Many of its teachings, in fact, from the Qur'an that Elijah Muhammad got, and for, were almost contradictory to some of the teachings of the Qur'an. But you, I always tell my students when I teach this subject, whether it's in seminary or universities, that the way you have to understand the Nation of Islam, particularly in the early 1900s in America, it just inverts white supremacy. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. I uh, started going into my, uh, I'm in the American Embassy, so I'm feeling like I'll go into that American University professorial thing. I'm gonna slow down a little, is that okay? Yeah? 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 All right, sorry. Jeff, Jeff Q, is like that. This whole time I've been talking very slow because I had a translator and mashallah and Wolof and French. So, okay. So what the nation did, the nation of Islam, is it, it reversed the logic of, of racism and white supremacy. At the time, white supremacy, racism, was saying that white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men were on top of the totem pole, right? Biologically and spiritually. There was social Darwinist claims to say that biologically this was the most evolved species, right? And spiritually, saying the most civilized, the most spiritually connected to God. The nation of Islam throws this on its head 
and says, no. And, and not only did, let me step one step back, not only did white supremacy say that the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant man is on the top, and of course at the very bottom was the African, but they also would suggest that uh, that, that logic also made profound claims about divinity, right? Div who is divine? And uh, not only was one group of people on the bottom, but there was almost kind of that Rudyard Kipling type poetry, you know, the white man's burden, that that person was almost half devil, half child, right? 